policy dialogue webinar series of the ethnic mix survey data cost action and uh, i am uh, very uh, happy to be here uh, with all of you today uh, to introduce the first of uh, our policy dialogue webinars um, there will be four of these uh, webinars uh, being held during the months of may and uh, june and uh, the first one that one of today i will tell you more about the the rest of the seminars but let's focus now to the first one that is jointly organized by our action uh, that is a cost action that brings uh, together researchers from all sectors and the aim of this action was to improve the access the usability and the dissemination the survey data and the economic social and political integration of ethnic and migrant minorities and this web webinar is jointly organized with the European Commission Joint Research Center, and particularly with the unit E6, this, uh, that is uh, the Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography, and the unit uh, I1, that is Monitoring Indicators and Impact Evaluation of the GRC. And the topic that we are going to address with our uh, uh, Inviter speakers is building a European common indicators on migrant integration and in particular focusing on the role of survey data on migrants and ethnic minorities. And our speakers today are from GRC, uh, Beatrice Dombre, first of all, and then Marco Scipioni. And from our cost action, the, our coordinator, uh, Professor Laura Morales. And uh, finally, we have a commentary from uh, Franz Eiffel that is from Eurofound, that is the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Condition that also is doing surveys on the well-being of the European citizens. Uh, so uh, with uh, no further uh, um, delay, I will uh, leave the floor to our uh, um, uh, speakers. So first of all, to uh, Beatrice Dombre, uh, that this, this is presenting about uh, European wide surveys, what use for policy making. And uh, of course, I forgot to tell you that you can post your questions uh, on the chat, either on the chat or in the uh, question and answer uh, uh, section that you uh, will find on your uh, Zoom uh, application uh, on the uh, uh, below uh, the <laughs> presentations. But, uh, okay, so please, uh, I leave the floor to Beatrice. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, my name is, and uh, you can see my screen, right? Okay, okay. So I'm Beatrice Dom, and indeed I work at the Joint Research Center of European Commission in a unit dealing with uh, indicators and impact evaluation. So today I will talk about uh, EU-wide surveys and what use for policy making. I will talk about 15 minutes, so it will be short. And I will discuss the following uh, aspects. First, the purpose of cross-national service, right? Then some of the challenges that uh, of any cross-national survey and I will say a few words about possible alternative data sources. And finally, I will uh, mention a uh, way forward if we want to make even better, even more use of cross-national surveys. So let's uh, me start with uh, cross-national surveys. So there are a lot of cross-national surveys uh, available nowadays. And the main purpose, uh, as the name indicates, is to do cross-national cooperative research, right? So um, those surveys are particularly powerful in that respect. And also because they normally contain first detailed information on the socioeconomic characteristics of the respondents if the surveys at the individual level. And they also collect normally information about perceptions, values, attitudes toward immigrants, for instance. And this type of information, which is self-reported, is, is normally not available in other uh, type of data. So as I was saying before, we have many surveys which, which cover a range of topics going from you know, economic indicators to 
uh, information on quality of life or even on literacy. Just to give you a few examples, I'm sure you are most of you are, uh, aware of it of them. But the European Social Survey, for instance, is has been carried out every two years since 2002, and it covers uh, EU countries and even beyond. Um, the European uh, Quality of Life of a Fund is also a cross-national survey, which has been very much used. Um, also, the rural parameter, and this I would like to say a few words. The rural parameters, the standard rural parameters, have been uh, in place since the mid 70s. And the standard ones are carried out twice a year in, in all EU member states, right? So, so those are potentially millions of observations uh, which are available for cross-country uh, cross uh, analysis. So the, the bottom line is I think that we every researcher or, or analyst who wants to use cross-national survey will never put in question the, use, the utility, the usefulness of such data sources. So the purpose of, of my next uh, discussion is not to, dis to, 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 to discuss whether this type of survey is available, but more to, to uh, uh, emphasize the potential challenges associated with any uh, cross-national survey. Okay, and so let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so before uh, discussing this, I just want to give you a, a few examples of cross-national surveys that we have used, for instance, at the European Commission to monitor uh, to monitor uh, EU values or EU perceptions. So one of them, for instance, is uh, fairness perceptions in the EU. Three years ago, we, the GRC Commission, uh, uh, special or parameters on fairness. And this survey had the unique fe feature as well to collect information on the educations of three generations, that is of the respondents, uh, parents of the respondents and grandparents. So, you know, this is this was possible because we had and, and, and so for the first time we had information on three generations on social mobility in a cross uh, national uh, cross country context. Another example is, of course, you are well aware about the EU Silk Survey, which is a key survey when it comes to monitor uh, labor market outcomes or inequality, income inequalities or poverty. Another example, uh, DG Reggio regularly commissions surveys to monitor the quality of life in European cities. And, um, and so here is an example uh, where we see where we monitor the satisfactions toward cultural facilities in European cities. So now, you know, so again, the, those cross national surveys are, are, are a unique tool if, if we want to monitor whatever uh, topic in a cross-country uh, context. But of course, there are some challenges also associated with the use of such surveys. And one of them is that those surveys are designed to provide reliable estimates at national level. So they are not designed to describe subnational population. You know, it can be defined in terms of nuts region, but also by socioeconomic groups. So what does it mean is that if, 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 if you use those surveys to carry out some studies at the, at the provincial level, for instance, normally the population is not going to be representative. And anyway, even if you would find post-stratification weights to correct for this, very often the sample size at subnational level is very small. So this is an issue of, 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 of course of cross-national surveys. Another issue of course or, or challenge is that uh, those surveys are very costly. And, uh, and, and there are, the cost is increasing with the quality of the survey, right? And most of us, when we use this type of survey, what do we do? We, we, we download the data set. We sometimes look at the background report, which provides some information on, on the response rates and some information on the statistics of the, of the units that uh, were interviewed. But we don't know much about the, the, the collection, the data collection process. And as a matter of fact, if we want the surveys to be of use for, for, and, and, and for cross-country comparison, we need to be sure about, uh, about we need to know about this uh, collection process and to know how the equivalency of abstract concepts, for instance, was ensured across countries, right? We need to know, of course, what was the response rate, but even more, whether the interviewer were trained, et cetera, et cetera. So if, you want, if we want to properly use this type of survey, we need to have all this background information first. And second, we need to be aware that the survey is going to be costly. Third, the third issue, uh, I think, is uh, most of the cross-national survey do not, are not longitudinal survey, right? So we don't follow 
the respondent over time. And this is a major limitation when you want to make some causal inference. So often you, 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 you cannot really draw from your correlation analysis uh, some causal statements. And finally, along this line as well, most of the information is self-reported, which means that there are some bias, right? Uh, which can be, for instance, uh, so social desirability bias, and, 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 and somehow which need to be taken into account uh, when dealing with this type of survey. So what alternative do we have? Well, of course, we could uh, try to use more uh, administrative data which are extremely powerful. Why are they powerful? Well, in a few words, uh, first of all, they are cost effective, right? Because they are not normally collected for uh, research purposes, but for administrative purposes. So basically they are for free. Also, those surveys normally cover a large population, sometimes the entire population of a country. So they are collected regularly. They normally allow to follow, to track um, people or units over time. And they are, you know, and they are accu accurate, right? It's not uh, based on self-reported information. So, of course, this is uh, extremely appealing. This type of, of of data sources. However, as as we know, for data security concern, most of those data sets are very difficult to access still nowadays. And more than this, if you want to do some cross-country analysis, you know, it's it's, it's those those serve those uh, administrative data are not do not have a cross-national design, right? And finally, the type of information you can retrieve from this type of, of, of uh, data set is relatively limited. You will never have the wealth of information you can find in, in, in most of the cross-national surveys. So um, where should we go in the future? Well, uh, of course, there is, uh, I mean, we will continue to use cross-national surveys, but perhaps if we, if we want to be able to make more often or more easily causal statement, which at the end of the day is what we want to do, right? When is we, we should include more often a survey experiments. And this has been done already uh, at, at several occasions, but this could be done more systematically, for instance, when it comes to rural parameter surveys or, or European social surveys. And so the, 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 the purpose of those, uh, you know, with survey experiment, if you combine a cross-national survey with a survey experiment, you combine the external validity of large cross-national survey and the internal validity of uh, randomization, right? So this is the best of the two worlds somehow. Uh, and so how do you do this? Well, you, you simply assign your respondents uh, randomly to a, a control and a, and, and a treatment group. And what you can change, you know, what, what the, the, the thing you can manipulate somehow is, a, for instance, the order of the question or the, even the content of the question. Um, exactly. Right. So if, if you want to know more about this, I, I put in the slide two uh, examples, which I think, are, I think are very interesting. One is about the driver of attitudes toward immigrants. And the purpose of this paper is to test the labor market um, threat hypothesis, you know, when it comes to explain the driver of immigrants. And it's very well done. Another one, another paper, which is more recent, is about, uh, from Alizina and, 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 and co-authors, is about preference for the redistributions and how your perceptions of mobility affect redistribution. Again, there, there is a survey experiment, which is very nicely done. So this is one way forward. Another way forward is would be to combine more often administrative records and survey data. So this is also very interesting. Why? It's because if you can already get for free somehow uh, information through, through administrative records, then you can you, you don't have to have too long cross-national surveys. And the, the length of the surveys, of course, affects the response rate, right? And, and the quality of the answers. So this is also a way to improve the, the response rates of the survey. Of course, there are some challenges associated with combining the, the, those two types of, uh, of data sources. Again, I put a, an example uh, from uh, Brucker and et al from 2018, which is a paper looking at uh, how, um, how um, the occupational uh, or the educational uh, statue of the for foreigners when they when they come in Germany, how the how important it is to to recognize those foreign qualification 
and the effect it has on the on the labor market outcome in Germany, right? And 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 here's a link. Uh, employment histories with a survey specifically targeting immigrants. Finally, another uh, method which is uh, very powerful if you want to use cross-national survey for sub-national analysis. So for instance, you're interested in poverty or income inequality at the provincial level and you do only have information from a cross-national survey at the national level, at least it's, it's, it's the survey is representative at the national level what you can do is to rely on small area estimation methods and uh, to combine those two data sources. And this will allow you to forecast, to predict at the uh, local level, some information retrieved from the, 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 the survey. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and uh, I will give back the floor to, to um, uh, wait, I'm going to stop to share my, stop sharing. So thank you very much. And um, I give back the floor to Elena. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Beatrice, for uh, your presentation. So as uh, Guido has highlighted in the chat, you can, uh, of course, uh, uh, have uh, yeah, a very specific question related to uh, the presentations uh, and we will be happy to answer meanwhile. So I see that there is a, a, a specific question <laughs> that is uh, already out for uh, Beatrice. Uh, so uh, Beatrice, is the question about small area estimation? Yeah, so okay. in, in a nutshell, nutshell to do to employ this type of method, what you need. So how does it work? I, I'm going to give you an example. You have information in your uh, cross-national survey about um, income, for instance, and occupation, right, of the respondents. And uh, you would like to use and 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 but you do have information only at the national level, and you, you and and you would like to compute uh, inequality indices at the provincial level. So in this cross national survey, you do have information on the province where 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 where, where the respondents live, right? Then you will um, and, and then you will use census data, for instance, where you do have information on the occupation of. The entire population, right? So from the survey, you will predict, you will look at the association with the regression analysis between the occupation and the income. And from this, and then you will use this regression, the param estimated parameter, to infer the income at the uh, provincial level. So to answer your question, as long as it's possible, as long as you have information on the cities or the functional urban areas, in both surveys, right, uh, then it's possible, yes. I mean, yes, theoretically, it's possible. Okay, thank you, Beatrice. So um, I will uh, now uh, introduce you the next presentation. Um, okay, we have another commentary. <laughs> Uh, about uh, the fundamental rights survey. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, I will uh, introduce, uh, uh, I think that Laura uh, will mention the fundamental rights surveys because uh, it's already, I believe, in the uh, cost action database. And I will uh, introduce the next presentation. This is by Marco Scipioni from GRC. Uh, GRC and it's uh, Euro European Union-wide surveys as a source for indicators of migrant integration. So I will leave the floor to Marco. Yep. Hi, everyone. Let me share quickly my screen. OK, I hope that you can see it now. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, I'm Marco. I'm from the uh, Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography. And today I'll briefly introduce what you can get from um, Eurobarometer data when it comes to attitudes towards uh, uh, immigration. Um, not sure, it's not moving. Okay, so um, as I was saying, uh, 
I will briefly introduce the kind of information that you can get from uh, Eurobarometer surveys, and this will basically take most of the presentation, and then we'll combine, we'll conclude with uh, some reflection on whether it's possible to combine this kind of data <coughs> with other um, data sources and other surveys, and uh, very much like what uh, um, uh, Beatrice has just said, um, I will conclude with possible way possible ways ahead. But before doing all that, let me first take a step back and uh, start to reflect on what we mean by um, indicators. I think that um, due to the um, audience that we have, it is useful to uh, point out the fact that in the JSC in-house, we have um, a so-called competence center on composite indicators and scoreboard, the so-called COIN, uh, with uh, the specific mandate to work on exactly um, indicators and the possibility of aggregating them. So um, I'm pointing this out, this out not only to promote what they're doing, which is a fantastic work, um, and they are developing tools, methodologies, and also auditing uh, uh, composite indicators worldwide, but also to point out the fact that they have very refined ways of talking and and and, and working on uh, uh, indicators. But I think that overall we can all reconvene uh, on the fact that indicators tend to be something that um, tools that measure phenomena and a huge range of phenomena over time and across um, uh, geographical. Uh, unit. So there's the, this key element of comparability that I will try to uh, um, emphasize all across the, the, the presentation. Uh, so what you can find in uh, Eurobarometer surveys? Well, actually quite a lot. There are dedicated surveys on immigration and integration. Um, then there are a series of questions that have been asked in the past uh, regarding immigration and integration in the standard Eurobarometer that Beatrice was referring to before, um, as well as other questions that have been asked more intermittently in the past. And then there are other surveys that are uh, fielded more or less regularly that do not focus primarily on immigration, but still contain a lot of information that can be useful for both researchers and uh, policymakers alike, and these are surveys regarding, for instance, discrimination, or surveys that investigate attitudes at the regional level, or as again Beatrice was referring to before, at city level. Okay, so let's take these in turn. So the first one is um, dedicated surveys on immigration integration. The last one was fielded in the late 2017 and got the results in 2018. This was a survey covering a huge range of topics from obviously perception of immigration, but also information regarding contacts, the type of contacts between respondents and immigrants, frequency of the contact. Also, there were questions regarding misinformation, and then a huge block of questions regarding not only perception of integration, which you have uh, uh, plotted here, but also obstacles to, towards uh, integration and policies towards integration amongst other. So if we uh, want to carry out this kind of exercise, uh, in during this presentation and think about what use can can we make of, of uh, Eurobarometer data towards uh, establishing indicators. Well, the first limit that we have with this kind of survey is that it's a one-off, okay? However, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that also ESS, uh, the European Social Survey that Beatrice was referring to before, had uh, um, ad hoc modules regarding immigration. The, early, the first one was in the early 2000s, the last one was 2014. So we can see this kind of dedicated surveys on immigration integration as, as a sort of stepping stone towards establishing more regularly a more uh, in-depth analysis of attitudes towards immigration and integration in the union. Then another limit that we need to consider again with the back of our mind, this idea of indicators is uh, portrayed in, uh, in these two graphs. So uh, as I was saying, these two plots show basically a breakdown of the respondents uh, um, to, the, to the twin question of whether or not they consider the integration to be successful at the country level on the left-hand side and at the local level. 
on the right hand side. So considering that uh, there's a lot of attention regarding integration dynamics at the local level, it would have been great to uh, um, link this kind of data on the perception of integration at the local level with actual data on outcomes at it, uh, of uh, immigrants integration at the local level. Eurostat data, for instance, release uh, yearly um, disaggregated data at NATS2 on integration outcomes, for instance, in, the, in terms of labor market and, and education. So ideally, we would be able to link these two different sources of, inf of, of information. However, as Beatrice pointed out, uh, um, here we, we, before, here we're facing a, a problem in terms of sample size. So if we want to break down uh, the surveys along NAT line, meaning along regional lines, we end up with regions with a very small sample size. We're talking about less than 10 respondents in many. Uh, not so what the the actual possibility of connecting perception of integration at the local level with actual data as of now it is is very limited okay it is a possibility it's something that can be considered for the future but it's for the moment precluded moving to the standard eurobarometer here the the, the good news is that we've got time coverage which is plus in terms of our uh, ultimate goal of establishing indicators so these are what i'm showing here is uh, two again twin questions regarding the, the image that respondents have uh, regarding immigration of people from uh, within the union on the left hand side and outside the union on the right hand side and we can see that here we cover um, uh, a period of time that goes as far back as 2014 and relative to for instance again uh, the ESS we have high frequency data because as Beatrice was saying um, the standard year barometer is, is um, fielded twice per year. However, compared to uh, what you can gather in, in the ESS, the basket of question that is actually regularly asked by the standard Eurobarometer is fairly limited compared to the ESS. And here we face a first problem. The second is that the, the, the period that is actually covered by the data is fairly small compared again to the ESS that go back to the early 2000s. So there are some pros and cons that policymakers and, and uh, researchers alike should be, I think, aware. Uh, on the positive side, um, we not only have um, data information regarding attitudes towards immigration, but we also have information regarding the, the so-called salience of immigration. These are uh, questions such as what are two most important issues for either you personally, your country or the EU. And again, here we can appreciate the, the relatively high frequency of, of the data, uh, particularly also when it comes to country, the country level, we have also uh, more than two decades worth of, of data. These, uh, these slides on the salience of, of uh, immigration is a nice bridge to two more data sources that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first one is not the survey on public opinion in EU region. And this is a survey that has been uh, first uh, carried out in 2012 and then 15 and 18, okay, in all member states. And uh, this is meant to be representative of the uh, regional level, meaning NATS level, okay? Uh, this is a very rich in terms of sample size uh, um, survey, and that allows and enables us to, to really link the uh, data on public perception with all the data at subnational level. However, as Beatrice was again to say before, uh, the key problem here is one of cost. So due to the fact that the sample size is, is fairly big, uh, these kind of surveys are very costly. That comes to the detriment uh, 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 when to the detriment of the, the amount of questions that can be asked. And it's not by, by chance, actually, that the only question uh, revolving around immigration here is one of salience. We don't have any kind of information regarding the public attitudes, uh, opinions regarding uh, immigration from these kind of surveys. 
again, uh, the last slide that I'm going to show you again shows the, the kind of death that we can um, leverage uh, when we look at uh, Eurobarometer surveys. And this is, again, not the survey that uh, that is uh, showed you before. This is the quality of life in, in cities. Again, the positive point uh, regarding uh, developing indicators is that we've got time series here. This, this survey has been filled repeatedly in the in the past. It's obviously a survey that is not meant to be representative of the country, um, but really targets cities. Okay, but uh, again, if we consider that immigrants in Europe tend to overwhelmingly gravitate towards cities and that integration policies uh, again tends to be implemented mostly at the local level, these kind of information that you can uh, uh, retrieve in these surveys becomes very, very interesting. Again, same caveat as before, uh, this is uh, a very interesting data sources. However, with if the ultimate goal is to develop indicators, here we face the problems of comparability over time because the questions slightly changed. Um, and also, again, connected to the fact of uh, how costly these kind of surveys are, the, the, the basket of questions being asked is, is fairly small. I'll conclude with two overall uh, reflections. One is regarding the possibility of combining Eurobarometer data with other surveys and information. This is very straightforwardly done when it comes to, for instance, official data from Eurostat, uh, particularly at the country level. When we are talking about merging it with regional levels, all the caveats that we mentioned before apply. So um, all concerns regarding sample size or comparability or whether or not the actual uh, outcome that we would like to measure is present in the data uh, are all concerns that are valid here. Uh, for uh, uh, researchers, particularly, there's, there's possibility, obviously, of aggregating microdata, for instance, from LFS, and this is, again, straightforwardly done at the country level. Uh, however, for the regional or local level, um, we, we, we have uh, some, some problems here. I'll conclude uh, very much like uh, what Beatrice has said with two actual two pleas. What, the, the first one is to include in a much more systematic manner survey experiment. I think that the ESS, but also all the surveys, European Election Service, for instance, have already started to, to do that and paved the way towards including in a much more uh, regular manner survey experiments in in their survey design and, and preparation. And the, the key point, however, if the ultimate goal is to uh, construct indicators, is to preserve the time series that we accumulated uh, so far, um, but also to, to uh, it's an, uh, also an invitation to sit down and consider carefully what kind of key questions we would like to to ask and be included in the standard Eurobarometer. And it's not necessarily the case that we need uh, uh, two data points per year. These can be diluted over time, but it's something that we I think that we would need to start thinking about in for 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 the future. I'll stop here. So thank you, Marco, for uh, your presentation. And uh, I am uh, OK. There is uh, a question <laughs> uh, that is quite uh, uh, interesting. It's about uh, uh, UNHCR. Uh, let me read it because it's long. So, dear speakers, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, this is Frederick Smets, that is an education officer at uh, UNHCR that uh, uh, is uh, uh, asking that, uh, okay, so his agency, the United Nations Refugees Agency, has been facing challenges in getting disaggregated data for its own indicator of refugee population in several fields in Europe. One of those is to get precise figures on the numbers of refugees on employment using social services and also on enrollment of refugee children 
and young people in primary and secondary and higher education. And there is a lack also of administrative data. Uh, so uh, this is um, a very huge challenge for uh, UNHCR Europe for uh, those aspects of refugees integration. And uh, so uh, it's impossible for them to organize population surveys because they have no resources. So the question is, are there any ways for the uh, Joint Research Centers or other agencies in the European Union, for instance, Eurostat, uh, to help us in gathering more disaggregated data specifically on refugees? <laughs> so it's uh, for you guys. <laughs> Maybe, sorry, maybe Elena, maybe we can um, ask Marco the, the, the question that is uh, uh, posted by Fran McGinnity, which is uh, more specifically linked to this the presentation. presentation. Okay. And yeah. then during the Q&A and the discussion, we can certainly address also the question that uh, Frederick uh, posed so that we keep the um, you know the flow of the um, of the presentation going and then we go back to the overall question if you don't mind no no that's perfect yeah marco there's a question about uh, if you can expand a little bit a little bit more on matching you and lfs with you uh, sorry you lfs with your barometer data um we have yeah, okay kind of yes an experience I'll, with that. yeah 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 I'll, I'll try to be very quick on this i can actually uh, uh, also address some of the questions that Frederick has, has asked. So Frank first. Okay, so yes, um, well, at national data, it is fairly straightforward. Also, you've got aggregated data from LFS uh, in, in Eurostat databases. This is straightforwardly done. I was mentioning uh, um, the LFS because um, with Obviously, provided that you've got access to the microdata, um, you can uh, uh, try to retrieve information at regional level. I think you're aware that you've got uh, it's um, you've got up to NATS two level uh, um, in in uh, LFS, so that you can try to rearrange and aggregate data at that level. I am aware that NATS three is also available for some countries, but. Uh, uh, the procedures to get that data is a bit more tricky um, and possibly if that is what your research or, or your uh, uh, project is about, you can try to link that with the data that you've got in your barometer. But it's the same thing that you can do also for the European Social Survey, okay? Then uh, I try to, to, to caution uh, uh, in this regard, because not all data, exactly as Beatrice has said before, not all data um, uh, can be meaningfully aggregated at that level, okay? Because obviously you've got sample size that are of different sizes, and uh, whether or not you got a representative sample uh, in Eurobarometer data at that level depends very much on the survey. Okay, so uh, for the regional series, that's not a problem. It is designed to be representative at NUTS level. For the standard Eurobarometer, it is not. So that's uh, that's a concern. Okay, I, feel free to email me, and we can uh, talk about it more if if needs be. Uh, regarding what Frederick has said, so yes, that's that's a key issue. Um, so I'm aware of some research. Um, that has been done in, in this regard. I'd like to point out, for instance, that Tommaso Frattini has done some work uh, regarding uh, um, the possibility of breaking down, um, let's say, the, the immigrant population in terms of the, let's say, the channel of entry. And this was mainly based on the ad hoc LFS module of 2014 that provided a breakdown by uh, admission channel. So that's, that's something that you may want to look at. Okay, but I'm aware that we've got a meeting in, in some days, so we can, we can talk about it later. Okay, stop here. Yeah, there are uh, two questions again for you, uh, Marco, in the chat. And I think is they are specific on your presentation. Yeah, because we have this both. <laughs> yes, Marco, there's a, there's a couple of questions. One is about um, the possibility to um, uh, 
select, let's say, the um, questions that um, are going to be held uh, constant in the uh, standard barometers in a way that they might uh, immediately integrate with the action plan on uh, integration and inclusion so that this could be uh, a better way to monitor new policies and assess how your member states are faring uh, in realizing the, the priorities. And another from uh, Luca Barani um, um, that is asking what kind of relationship uh, you uh, consider there might be between high or low salience of immigration as a topic and uh, drivers of perception of successful or unsuccessful integration at the national level through the Eurobarometer surveys. Uh, if you think that these are questions that you might uh, address during the general com uh, conversation at the end uh, with Q&A, we can uh, kindly ask uh, the attendees to, to wait until then, or if you have a very quick answer, we can proceed. You yes, can have these, uh, these are likely to be fairly long uh, replies, so we can perhaps postpone it towards the end. Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's go to our next presenter, that is our action coordinators, Laura Morales, that is going to talk about uh, the main uh, output of uh, the ethnic survey data uh, action, that is the data hub. That, and uh, so I leave the floor to Laura. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Elena, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you to the Joint Research Center colleagues uh, for co-organizing this uh, webinar with us. Uh, uh, as Elena just said, I'm the coordinator of uh, the Cost Action Ethnic Survey Data, which is uh, the International Ethnic and Immigrant Minorities Survey Data Network. And this is a, a network that is funded through the Cost Association and the Horizon uh, 2020 program of the European Union. So in, in my talk, I will firstly uh, present briefly the Ethnic Survey Data Network and uh, what are their goals. And I will then uh, focus specifically on our activities and the collective uh, research efforts that we've been undertaking to generate a number of open access and open data tools uh, that serve to enhance our ability to understand the multidimensional process of the integration of ethnic and migrant uh, minorities across Europe with survey data. Um, and as we know, there are numerous data sources that we can use to learn more about the processes of inclusion and exclusion of ethnic and migrant minorities. And Beatrice has done a, a wonderful job at actually uh, summarizing uh, the various sources that can be used and can be mobilized uh, together from administrative data to official statistics, from qualitative and ethnographic studies to survey data. Uh, however, our network uh, focuses particularly on quantitative survey data uh, because we feel that it's uh, an essential source of information, the value of which is currently very much underexploited. Um, so, as you know already from previous presentations, quantitative survey data are very rich in providing information um, and in providing information about a wide range of aspects relating to lifestyles, to behaviors, to attitudes, to opportunities to barriers, to skills, and along, et cetera. And they have the advantage of providing information on the individual level of the minorities whose integration we're interested in. And then I should uh, emphasize this because our uh, network uh, uh, focuses on survey data where uh, these minorities are, are either the primary respondents of the surveys or they are a very large subsample of, of the surveys. Uh, so we're not so much interested in the majority of the population's views about immigration or immigrant integration, but actually the own experiences of inclusion and exclusion of uh, the minorities as such. Um, and additionally, uh, when surveys are designed with a longitudinal component, obviously their value notably increases because they provide information about causal processes and they also allow taking into consideration uh, the multivariate nature of inclusion and exclusion uh, processes. So in this context, the Ethnic Survey Data Network has uh, set itself uh, a number of ambitious goals to allow for the greater reuse and comparative analysis of all this richness of data that is still, in our view, very much underused. And uh, to that end, uh, we aim at informing about the data that is available specifically on ethnic and migrant minorities across Europe. 
And uh, we're fostering the archiving and sharing of the existing survey data so that it becomes available to a wider public in open access. Um, we're also working on post harmonizing a number of data sets that were independently produced uh, so that we can promote comparative analysis on the integration of ethnic and migrant minorities. And uh, as a last kind of uh, um, major uh, goal, we provide a platform to coordinate future data collection to maximize comparability. Obviously, we also have other goals that relate to capacity generation and training, but I will focus on the goals uh, that uh, you have seen highlighted in black uh, font on the previous slide. So, um, how do we do all of this? Uh, well, we pursue all of these uh, core goals that relate to the study of uh, the economic, social, and political integration of ethnic and migrant minorities through survey data by undertaking specific tasks that relate to the compilation, the sharing, and the pooling of survey data. And we work on four core tasks. Uh, first, uh, 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 compiling information about the existing surveys of ethnic and migrant minorities in an online tool that is called the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry. Secondly, uh, we generate, uh, we're generating right now a question data bank that uh, captures uh, the richness of the survey questionnaires that focus specifically on ethnic and migrant minority integration. Thirdly, we undertake uh, data post-harmonization to generate new full data sets uh, from previously independent, uh, independently con uh, conducted surveys. And fourthly, uh, we're designing and implementing a data playground um, of ethnic and migrant minority survey data that will allow to dynamically analyze and visualize a selection of the post-harmonized uh, pooled data sets. Each of these four tasks uh, will lead to a new online tool uh, that will all be available as separate components of the ethnic and migrant minority survey data hub. Uh, which is produced by uh, uh, this network, the Ethnic Survey Data uh, Network. Now, our work is more advanced on the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry, and although I will be referring to our progress with some of the other tools, I will devote a bit more of, of my remaining time uh, to briefly present uh, the survey registry. Um, I would like uh, to emphasize that the production of the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry is a truly uh, collective undertaking and that it has been made possible by the joint efforts of the Ethnic Survey Data Network um, and the funding provided by both the Horizon uh, 2020 Project uh, Shock, the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, and the French National Research Agency through the project uh, for Ethnic uh, Quant. Now, uh, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry has been conceived to facilitate the reuse of existing survey data by helping to overcome the considerable challenges that researchers face uh, to work on ethnic and migrant minorities because uh, precisely survey data are often difficult to find, to access and to reuse. So the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry is a free online tool that facilitates access to existing surveys at the same time that it provides detailed information about the quality and the technical characteristics of the existing survey data. And it does this through a very detailed display of information about the data and what is technically called um, the metadata. Now, um, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry has been designed and developed with uh, what are referred to as the FIR principles in mind. And these principles aim to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we do all of this by making surveys easy to locate, uh, providing information on whether the survey microdata is available and where or how they are available, and ensuring uh, that the information about the data, uh, the metadata, is easily available both through human and, and machine searches. Finally, we make it reusable by promoting its reuse uh, through our own uh, research, but also by providing information on how uh, to reanalyze it. In its current version, uh, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry already captures information on nearly 1,200 surveys from 24 different countries. And in the next one, two months, uh, we aim at uploading the information on six more countries that are quite advanced in the compilation of the information about surveys produced in those countries. 
And uh, we would hope that by the end of this summer, the registry is complete with metadata on around 1,400 surveys across 30 European and uh, neighboring uh, countries. I will now very briefly show you how the front end uh, user interface of the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry works, uh, allowing everyone interested in the survey data on the um, uh, ethnic and migrant minorities to search for data of uh, their interest. And actually, um, if you're interested in, in looking at this at yourself uh, uh, on your computers directly, I've shared on the chat, um, the specific uh, link of what I will be um, showing in, in just uh, a minute. And, and that's the link um, if you'd like to uh, see it at your own time. So if you go to that link uh, uh, later on at your own time, you will be able uh, to see uh, this, uh, this page uh, that provides you um, at, at the first glance with all of the surveys um, that have been captured uh, so far. And you can see that it will display the 1,187 um, survey records that we already have. But uh, in addition to, to doing that, and you can see that the surveys are displayed here uh, with a, a short uh, snippet uh, of information, um, of very elementary information of each of the surveys, uh, you can then click on each individual kind of blue uh, headline name and have uh, the information, the detailed information on all of the characteristics um, of uh, the survey. Our um, uh, metadata contains more than 200 um, variables that describe um, all of the elements of any given um, study. And you can have all this kind of very detailed information of all of the surveys um, that you might be interested in. Obviously, uh, we don't expect most people to be browsing the kind of nearly uh, 1,200 surveys that we have now. And this is the reason why there's a number of different uh, filtering options that you can uh, use. So you can select uh, which countries uh, you're interested in. Uh, 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 with the country selection, you can also decide that you're interested only on subnational surveys, which would be those done at the local or the regional or the provincial level. You can actually select on the uh, basis of the type of uh, survey and sampling design, whether these are single cross section um, uh, surveys or whether they are repeated cross sections or longitudinal um, surveys. You can also search on the basis of the types of um, ethnic and migrant minority groups that are covered by the uh, service. And you have here a very long list of uh, different uh, terms that we use um, uh, to capture those uh, groups and, and minorities. But you can also uh, uh, select um, the surveys on the basis of the availability of uh, the survey data set, whether they are publicly available or not. You can make a number of other kind of free text uh, searches. You might be interested only in uh, surveys that uh, cover the Roma population. So you can make selections on the basis of uh, free keywords, or you can also uh, select um, on the basis of all or the vast majority of the survey metadata variables that we have um, uh, compiled in uh, the registry. Uh, one that uh, we anticipate might be of uh, some interest uh, to the users will be the topic that the uh, survey focuses on. So for example, you might be interested in, in specifically those surveys uh, that relate specifically to topics relating to asylum seekers and refugees, and that allows you to make uh, selections that are then visible here um, on uh, the panel. Now you can explore all of that um, at your own time. I will continue um, by um, actually uh, uh, giving you a kind of very short uh, presentation of other aspects uh, of the work that we've been doing on uh, the ethnic survey data uh, network. And one of these core aspects is the design and uh, implementation of an ethnic and migrant minorities question data bank. Unfortunately, the existing funding uh, will only allow us to work on uh, smaller scale uh, pilots relating to specific areas of integration and a select number of countries. Um, and we view the, the question data bank both as a tool on its own merits and as a necessary step uh, to the production of post-harmonized uh, pooled data sets. 
So the, the question data bank uh, pilots, um, as of now at least, uh, focus on a selection of 10 countries that are included already in the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry and are the countries that are shown in green and yellow on this map. For those in green, we have already started working on their survey questionnaires. And for those in yellow, uh, we will start doing so uh, very soon as they've only recently been included in the um, uh, survey registry. As we don't have the financial and human resources to capture all of the survey questionnaires produced in these 10 countries at once, we have focused our three pilots on the questionnaires that focus particularly on uh, three topics that are relating to what the EU indicators of immigrant integration refer to as active citizenship. That is, we focus on civic life and political participation, on the perceptions and experiences of stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination, and on feelings of belonging, social identity, as well as cultural and social norms. And we have selected these three subtopics because we know that they are less well captured by other initiatives at the EU um, level. We are well advanced in doing work around the first pilot on civic life and political participation, which has included deciding um, on the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the selection of questionnaires that we will be considering in the question data bank for these topics, but we also have defined our metadata scheme, we have found a tool to store and manage the questionnaires, and we have established a detailed workflow for compiling, storing, and cataloging uh, the questionnaires. To date, uh, we have identified, located, downloaded, stored, and recorded more than 200 questionnaires uh, for surveys in eight of the 10 countries included in the pilot, so the green countries that I showed before. Um, and we are currently uh, working on the inclusion of the metadata uh, about the questionnaires and all the question items included in, the, in, in them through the use of the software Collectica. And this has been a steep learning process uh, so that we can establish uh, clear workflows uh, as to how to document the questionnaires in a manner that the uh, European question bank uh, that uh, will actually uh, be able to harvest this metadata can uh, kind of properly function um, in synchronization with our uh, question data bank. Our next steps uh, will consist of linking each individual question item in the questionnaires uh, that we're going to be uh, putting on our question data bank uh, to a hierarchy of concepts of integration that has been identified by uh, work group three of uh, our ethnic survey data network, uh, as well as to start adding questionnaires into the system and integrating it with the European question uh, bank. And this work should progress well throughout uh, the summer. Now, linking questionnaire items to concepts is a necessary step to post harmonization. And so we have progressed in doing preparatory work that will allow us to start working on this post harmonization as well in the coming months. And this is something that we've already started planning for, but we don't have results to show you yet. And, and we hope that after the summer, we'll have um, something to show you um, already. Um, and here our work consists of linking specific dimensions of integration, which are actually finer grained and more detailed than the ones identified by the EU indicators of immigrant integration, to the specific topic categories identified by the uh, tool on the survey registry that I just uh, presented to you. So the one that classifies surveys on the basis of the topics uh, that they cover. And as you can see in these two um, slides, we have 14 different integration dimensions and our pilots uh, for the uh, ethnic and migrant minorities question data bank uh, at, at the time being can only cover three of them because of uh, a matter of resources. But uh, this is a kind of a, a medium to long term agenda and we hope uh, to uh, get uh, uh, future funding uh, to continue with the other uh, pilots topical integration dimension uh, um, topics uh, later on. Uh, but beyond the larger integration dimensions that I just showed you, uh, we also need to specify a hierarchy of sub-dimensions, concepts and sub-concepts that are linked to each questionnaire item so that that hierarchy can become useful for post-harmonization. For example, in a questionnaire, we might find a zero to 10 scale of how much the respondent, uh, a minority respondent, identifies him or herself with a given ethnic group. And the classification work that we're doing allows us to link 
that questionnaire item to the narrower subconcept of self-identification with ethnic group, uh, which belongs to the broader concept of self-identification, which itself belongs to the integration dimension of identity. So this kind of work needs to be done for all questionnaire items and we, and that we encounter in the questionnaires uh, that we will be processing in the ethnic and migrant minorities uh, question data bank um, in the coming uh, months. The last stage in our workflow, um, and, and this is where I'm, I'm going to be finishing, will be then to move from questionnaire items and concepts to the generation of post-harmonized uh, pooled data sets. At this stage, I can only present the plans that we have started designing uh, as we're at a very early stage of, of progress on this task. And um, with the questionnaires that we have been compiled in pilot one of uh, uh, the question data bank, we will be making a selection of those that are freely available for reuse and reanalysis. And this obviously is information that we have from the uh, survey registry. And this is the reason why we need to complete that step before. Um, and using the uh, ethnic and migrant minorities question data bank online tool, we will be able to identify the concepts of interest and in which surveys they appear. So our plan is to then to use existing free software tools such as GISI's term stats to post harmonize common comparable categories of comparable surveys depending on the sample design and the focus of uh, those surveys, both the topical focus, but also the minority focus of those surveys. And this will allow us to produce a number of post-harmonized subsets of pooled uh, survey data sets that will combine surveys that were produced independently. Now I'm, I'm finishing and I hope that this presentation of the work that we're doing will have interested you. And I would like to conclude my talk by inviting all of you uh, in the audience to collaborate. Uh, with the Ethnic Survey Data Network. Uh, and you can do this in, in a number of ways. So you can do this by adding metadata uh, to the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry if you or your organization are producing surveys uh, specifically contacted with ethnic and migrant minority populations. But you can also contribute to one of our pilots or lead a new topical pilot if you have human resources to contribute. And obviously, you're also most welcome to contribute to the conceptual hierarchy work uh, that we are undertaking. We will also, of course, uh, welcome any suggestions. And I, I obviously look forward to any questions that um, you may have. So thank you very much for your attention. And you will be able to find here a number of ways to which you can keep in touch with us and with the work that we do. Uh, the links uh, to our website, uh, to our email addresses, uh, but also importantly, our Twitter account, our Sonodo. Uh, page and our uh, Facebook uh, page as well. And I will be sharing this on the Q&A area uh, for everyone to be able to access them. Thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, uh, I'm checking if there are any quick uh, uh, questions that you can answer. Um, I think that, yeah, Rosalina is uh, commenting and uh, uh, she said that it will be, it will be good to have a combination of data on attitudes of the general population and ethnic minority experiences on the other side. Um, so I think that that's all for now and we can leave all that for the final discussion. And now I, uh, leave the floor to Franz Eiffel uh, that uh, is uh, a research officer uh, of uh, at uh, Eurofound. Uh, he works on the working life unit and is an expert on data collection and official statistics having been also uh, working before previously at Statistic Austria and Franz we will give us a perspective on the <clears throat> Um, from the point of view of uh, Eurofound uh, on the side of the data producing, but also data user. Uh, for uh, So thank you, Franz. Thank you, Elena. Um, yeah, I, I will just give a couple of uh, short remarks to complement uh, what my previous speakers have already mentioned very specifically. So I will uh, keep it up broadly and give some perspective of uh, EU-wide service, basically. First of all, I would like to recall the 
the surveys we have at Eurofound, so the European Quality of Life Survey was already mentioned, and we have the European Working Conditions Survey. Uh, there were already six rounds in the field um, in, a, in a distance of five years. And um, both of these surveys are actually collecting some kind of uh, migration background. So both are collecting, for instance, the country of origin of uh, birth of both parents. Um, so we can, have, we can have some breakdowns of this data uh, on an EU level. And this EU level analysis in the context of EU level policies, um, I think this is the very the, the added value of these EU-wide services, basically, because you can obviously not do very detailed analysis of these groups where we have quite small sample size. But uh, alongside the, the broad population, it's interesting to see uh, the differences here. Also, we um, applied some experiments in our surveys, like, for instance, mixed modes experiments or push to web experiments. We also did some matching with our service and official statistics, for instance, uh, matching between um, European Working Conditions Survey and uh, EU Silk to get, for instance, um, background household uh, income information uh, to our data. So we are already trying to um, yeah, have these experimental parts a little bit integrated in our service. The last wave of the uh, working condition survey had to be interrupted because it's a face-to-face -face survey and uh, that was at the outset of the pandemic. So this will be taken up now this year, so quite next month actually as a phone survey. So it will be different and hence not really comparable to the previous waves, but it's a kind of another experiment how we can um, deal with, with these kind of informations over the phone. Um, what are the added values? Well, some indicators are not in the official Zaragoza indicators, for instance, um, important uh, data on, on mental well-being, like the WHO5 indicator, uh, which is collected in both the, so that the items are both collected in the um, European Quality of Life Survey and in the uh, working conditions survey. And this is important for understanding the experiences of people with uh, migrant descent and also to, yeah, to formulate relevant policies on these basis. And of course, here the breakdowns are of interest, like for instance, inactive population, um, gender perspective, the migrant perspective. In the working conditions survey, it is probably worth mentioning that we um, have sectors with a very high proportion of migrant minority workers. So this is already interesting to, even if we probably cannot break down by sector and by uh, migrational background, but it's already interesting in itself to see these sectors with a higher proportion of migration and to draw some conclusions from there. For instance, we had also some um, media coverage on disproportionate COVID impact um, on some of the sectors with higher migrational proportions. We had a blog on, on tales of two sectors where we looked into the interactive service workers, uh, particularly those uh, working in the healthcare sector with a high proportion again of um, of migrational background, if we think of the uh, personal care workers, for instance. And then, of course, um, I, I would like to acknowledge, I mean, the specialized service like uh, like FRA is doing, um, but also uh, we have heard about the EMM service and the EMM ecosystem. This is equally important um, to provide to the contextual data for the interpretation of the broader data of, um, we collect, we or others collect on, on EU level. And this makes sense to interpret what can be captured in these broader uh, perspectives. So this specialized service together with the EU-wide broader service can really give a very interesting perspective on, uh, on what's happening there uh, for specific groups such as uh, migrants and ethnical backgrounds. Um, what's coming up in the future is probably of interest. So there are a couple of official statistics forthcoming um, to feed the ecosystem and knowledge about the, um, the situation and the composition of societies. So particularly, for instance, at the moment, um, the ESTA Development of Population Service prepared, which is basically uh, summarizing the censuses of the 
uh, of the member states. In 2021, there is also a recurrent LFS module on, on migrants. Um, and, and we are also, as I already said, collecting the information on the European Working Conditions Survey right now, but then also in 2024, going back to the old face-to-face -face mode. And there will be another European Quality of Life Survey, which is currently planned for 26. So there are a lot of forthcoming uh, statistics out there. And yeah, I think I leave it there. It was just to complement a little bit what, uh, what the previous speaker said and to give a bit of a, a European perspective here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Franz, for your uh, overview on the surveys, uh, not only that Eurofound is uh, doing, but also generally the European uh, statistics are doing, the uh, Eurostat and so on. And um, so um, I have now, uh, we have now uh, 20 minutes left for uh, uh, the discussion. Um, so uh, I see that there are some uh, questions already. So I will uh, leave the speakers uh, to answer to the question that was were previously asked by uh, Frederick. We promised that Frederick is going to uh, get an answer about the difficulties of getting uh, information on uh, refugees population. If uh, someone would like to comment on that, please. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, maybe, sorry, um, if I, Marco um, and uh, Laura, of course, and Bea as well, uh, you can, um, of course, uh, start answering the questions that were there uh, on hold. But I would like to remind you also um, about another, um, let's say, pending overarching question that was raised by many, which is um, to make it, let's say, to put it in simple, very simple words, how would you see the, uh, let's say, uh, the role of survey uh, data and uh, the information that you can collect from the experiences that you have analyzing uh, the various sources that you, uh, that you used uh, to support to some extent, uh, as one uh, uh, attendee put it, uh, or find synergies with um, the data collection plans or indicator bank uh, that that you that you analyze. Find synergies with uh, the envisaged new action plan on integration and inclusion and the indicators that are going to be developed in that specific context. Okay, I can have a quick go at it. Um, okay, so uh, I'll try to be very brief. There were a couple of questions, including uh, the one that Guido asked. Okay, so um, linking uh, developing indicators with uh, the political priorities, I, I think that this is obviously very reasonable. Um, there's, there are two things that I'd like to, to point out. Um, first off, um, Considering the action plan is is something of uh, a repeated exercise that uh, has occurred in the past, I would uh, secure the kind of questions that are asked in the standard Eurobarometer as a sort of long-term uh, indicators that can be uh, um, uh, quick, that can be regarded as as a sort of long-time uh, um, long-term trend in in uh, in the public attitudes, and this is something along the lines of what other surveys have, have done uh, um, within Europe and outside, think about, for instance, Gallup, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one part of it. Uh, I would rather uh, include and put emphasis on uh, um, including questions that are tailored to evaluate or uh, in any way be linked with uh, political priorities in all the kind of surveys, such as ad hoc surveys. And I think that the, uh, uh, the dedicated surveys that we had in 2018 could be 
the, the, the best suitable uh, place to put questions that try to assess uh, um, policy agendas rather than having uh, them as a kind of constant question that is asked repeatedly over time uh, uh, in in the standard view barometer. This is not to say that we shouldn't reconsider the kind of questions that we ask in the standard Euro barometer. It's just that if we want to preserve a time series that is comparable over time, a uh, changing question because the political priorities change is not, uh, does not exactly go in, the, in that direction. Uh, I'll stop here for, this, for the moment uh, with this question. Uh, then uh, moving on to the refugee uh, and, and asylum seekers, I was mentioning before, this is a very complicated issue, particularly if you want to get comparable data and regular data across all member states. That's the, the most uh, uh, daunting challenge that we have. As I was saying before, there are uh, studies that have used uh, um, the uh, 2014 LFS um, to estimate, for instance, labor market integration of uh, refugees in, in Europe. Um, or the effect of specific policies such as employment bans that are included in, uh, in uh, uh, national and European uh, legislation. So that is uh, something that you may want to uh, look at. These are work by Tommaso Fortini, but uh, um, after the 2015 and 16 event, there has been a, a, a very a deluge of, of studies on uh, uh, asylum seekers and refugees. The key point remains to get comparable data and regular data uh, on, on this. And it's not entirely clear that we reach that, that stage. Um, I'll leave it here. I can perhaps add um, uh, to this uh, kind of more generic question um, about uh, the the action plan on uh, integration and inclusion. Uh, that there are kind of multiple strategies that could be pursued and that are actually um, being pursued. Uh, obviously, one of them is what is already being done. Um, with the help of Eurostat, of, of compiling uh, some of this um, information from official statistics where they exist, uh, but also uh, using uh, the, the cross-national or country-specific but coordinated uh, surveys that exist and have been mentioned already uh, by the previous um, speakers. Now, um, an alternative strategy, which is not one necessarily that we uh, in the Ethnic Survey Data uh, Network uh, have uh, specifically aimed at contributing would be uh, generating new sources of, um, of survey data, specifically for some of the areas on inclusion and integration that are less well captured um, by some of the kind of larger um, European wide uh, surveys. Now, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the past about how that could be achieved and one of the main difficulties is always um, uh, funding uh, for those efforts. But one could imagine perfectly um, if the funding was available and, and the European Commission uh, um, sort of had that sort of initiative um, to envisage in the future, not perhaps in the short term, but in a kind of more medium or long term, um, to complement the European social survey every so often with boost samples of uh, ethnic and migrant minority populations um, to capture all of the other dimensions uh, relating to the indicators of um, inclusion and integration that are not well uh, and properly captured through the kind of main socioeconomic surveys that are being um, conducted at, um, at EU level. Um, now that's one strategy that obviously um, uh, requires a specific funding and would require the, the specific stakeholders um, uh, like the European uh, Social Survey infrastructure to be um, interested in, in, in doing that. Uh, there have been other initiatives in the past uh, to try to stabilize uh, some sort of um, immigrant citizen survey um, over time and, and those have failed. Um, I think that at some point uh, the conversations will uh, need to be had about what is the kind of more stable um, mechanism and tool through which uh, those indicators will be available for the specific areas that are all, not already well covered by the uh, existing official statistics and existing um, official uh, surveys that are conducted, like the labor force uh, surveys, for example. 
Now, the work that we do in ethnic survey data uh, will allow some of that, but not on a systematic level for every single country, because obviously the work that we do of post harmonizing uh, surveys that exist rely on uh, the surveys that each of the countries or research teams individually uh, decide to undertake. So from that point of view, they're not necessarily designed, um, all of them to answer um, questions uh, uh, relating to the set of um, uh, the set of uh, indicators on inclusion and exclusion that have been prioritized by the European Commission. Yeah, um, maybe I say a word. There was a, a question also on um, EU silk and and how people how migrants are covered there. That was specifically in Ireland, but I think it's a general problem that, of course, uh, the the samples are very small in in these EU wide uh, service. Okay, EU silk has a good has a good general sample uh, and is probably the best source to to analyze these quantitative data on household income uh, poverty, etc. But it is, of course, uh, yeah, pooling. Uh, pooling is one one option, or taking together a couple of years is is certainly an option. The general problem is, first of all, that the sample size remains small, and um, so the uh, the conclusions we can draw from these data are far from perfect. The other thing is that a lot of uh, ethnic minority groups escape statistical observation as well. So they are really hard to capture, even if you have booster samples, etc. Uh, particularly if they have, for instance, an unclear legal status, it is even more, more difficult because uh, they might have uh, worries about uh, who these data are going to and if they, if they are anonymous and so on. So there are a lot of, of, of problems in capturing these uh, these marginal and, and minority groups in general with surveys, which is why I would say, yeah, the survey data we have, they are very useful. And particularly if we monitor trends over time and if we monitor developments, but of course uh, a big part we, re we want to observe, um, they need very specific attention. Like the specialized surveys are one way to do that, obviously. Uh, but also qualitative research, et cetera, is needed here, I think, to shed more light into the into the situation. So I think my point is, um, yeah, we, we should use the data uh, as much as possible and as far as we can use them. Uh, but on the other hand, being very much aware that there is a, a limit to, to the quantitative data we are collecting and um, that that is especially true for the uh, for the classical household surveys, where we just, I mean, another example is the posted workers who are very difficult to capture uh, and and who might be a couple of months in one country, a couple of months in another country, they have very specific working conditions, very often uh, below the, the thresholds of national um, labor and working conditions, uh, but they are very hard to observe. So these are general problems we have to tackle with other means, I think. If I may jump in and um, actually to emphasize what, what France was, was saying, I was involved in research regarding uh, a migrant labor force in agriculture, and it was very difficult to come by uh, any kind of information on seasonality. That's, that's a huge problem there because obviously you don't, you don't have that data. You've got da some kind of data regarding the implementation of the seasonal workers directive, but besides that, you don't have, uh, it's very difficult to get any, inf any information at the individual level. So that's, that's the problem. Um, I agree completely. Yeah, me I, I, as well, I, I will be happy to say something on this. So, um, I, I, you know, there, are, there will be a lot of uh, census data that will be soon available. I'm not working with census data myself, but this is certainly, uh, certainly a source of information on migrants, um, which uh, probably should be considered. And I was also wondering, again, I'm not familiar with this data set, but I think that the European Agency on Fundamental Rights might, might have a specific dedicated service uh, on migrants. And, uh, and then I would also very much uh, support what Laura said before, which is to boost uh, sample on migrants in some uh, traditional survey, which is probably a way uh, to get more uh, accurate information on, uh, on migrants uh, in the future. That's 
I would probably add um, to the discussion that we were uh, just having uh, that there are kind of uh, very different uses um, in relation to the indicators. And um, Francis is obviously right that uh, capturing uh, the kind of more marginalized uh, populations is actually difficult even in the boost samples. But if I'm not mistaken, in reality, um, the action plans and integration and inclusion, and for that matter, the vast majority of, of the European Commission's initiatives have, for the most part, targeted uh, legally resident uh, um, uh, migrants, or, or what is often referred to third country nationals. Um, and um, in that sense, I mean, we could even argue that if you do it properly, it's not impossible to uh, properly include um, even unauthorized and uh, um, oftentimes undocumented migrants. And there's a number of experiences of surveys that have successfully done that um, if the sample design is, is kind of properly um, undertaken. But I don't think that for the specific goals of the action plan, that would be much of a problem because uh, uh, boost samples would for the most part uh, be targeting the kind of legally uh, unauthorized uh, residents. Uh, and, and that's what the, those indicators are, are primarily um, interested in. Um, I would, however, um, argue that um, there are um, surveys that are being conducted by, uh, by, for example, the Fundamental Rights Agency to various uh, uh, types of, of minorities, including uh, um, ethnic and, and, and racial uh, minorities. Uh, that kind of the primary definition is not necessarily that they are immigrant, but uh, actually the status as a as a minority, and 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 those are quite useful. Um, and the different uh, uh, EU MIDIS uh, waves have, have evolved in in kind of very sophisticated ways in in terms of how uh, the sample design um, has been done, and then what are the groups that are being covered, um, and and that's information that it's uh, very useful. But as the the colleagues from FRA will be able to to tell themselves uh, 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 probably in another occasion of of our. Uh, um, uh, seminar series, perhaps. Um, one of the challenges that comes with that sort of kind of a specific um, and dedicated survey is how you um, warranty comparability across the countries when the populations, the underlying populations themselves actually are quite heterogeneous across uh, the EU member states. And this is a, a, a constant, a continuous challenge uh, that we face um, that when we are talking about the inclusion of whether you, you, you speak about um, uh, immigrants, uh, meaning first generation immigrants, or you are talking also about uh, second generation, so the descendants of immigrants or kind of the wider uh, notional category of ethnic um, uh, minorities, the underlying populations of interest across the countries are, are very different, both in terms of the origin, their outlook, the socioeconomic um, uh, composition. So, um, it will be challenging in itself to compare uh, uh, the situations of inclusion and, ex and exclusion across the countries uh, precisely because the underlying populations uh, differ. And um, I suppose that the best strategy in those cases is to try to look at, um, at improvements or uh, uh, back steps uh, on a country by country basis rather than necessarily trying to create uh, rankings across countries, which is one of the perhaps dynamics that you very often see when when these sort of cross-national comparisons are introduced that you get into some sort of race uh, uh, across the countries for who gets the better indicator or kind of the best result in those rankings and indicators when that's not necessarily the most appropriate comparison to be making but actually one about evolution over time within uh, uh, specific countries. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think that we are uh, perfectly on time. Um, I don't see any other additional uh, questions. Uh, so I think that uh, it's time to thanks uh, all the speakers and the conveners. Uh, let me thank uh, especially Guido uh, Tinture from JRC that uh, have uh, 
helped us to organize to organize this uh, first webinar and also Marcello Caramia they stayed a little bit in the dark today but is uh, co-organizing with me the series of uh, the uh, policy dialogue webinars uh, uh, that uh, is going to uh, continue uh, with the next webinar that will be held in three weeks the 25 uh, May um, and uh, will we host uh, um, IOM uh, Italy. Uh, Laura Bartolini is going to talk about the displacement tra tracking metrics. And then we have two presentations from our cost uh, action members that are uh, Philip Wanner from uh, University of Geneva and uh, Chris Boschman from uh, INED in Paris. And uh, in June, we are still confirming the two date, but uh, the webinars will be held for sure with the OECD and the EASO. Uh, so stay tuned. I put in, in the chat the page where you can find more information and also on our social media and so on. You will uh, get the links to register and Thank you everybody for your attention and for making this uh, um, webinar possible. And thank you, of course, to the speakers and to all the um, attendees. <laughs> and lastly, also to Brinia for the brilliant uh, help in organizing <laughs> the, the technical <laughs> aspects of the webinar. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.